was a product of the 1950s. Service was, in those decades, an honorable place to be. It was at the top of the heap in those years. To be an Army officer was a, a very special calling. And I had an opportunity uh, right out of the University of Oregon to go straight to flight school. Uh, and that's what I did. <laughs> We had a huge uh, elimination rate in flight school. You're sitting there saying, I really want to graduate. And all of a sudden, it dawned on us that the war was not going to end. In fact, if anything, it had gotten exponentially worse. And I was off to Vietnam. That was in 1971, July. It was like a big adventure. I had no idea what was coming. Uh, and trust me, young man, it was not an adventure. <laughs> I know my job inside and out. I'll be fine. Learned a lot about how to be miserable 12 hours in a cockpit with all of the paraphernalia that you're required to, to wear, the flight suit the chicken plates, front and back. Anyway, you're sitting in that seat and you're in your own mess. Your bowels are loose. You're sweating everywhere. You're infected in places that they just drive you. It's just agony. Your crotch, your armpits, even your eyelids. Probably some of the nastiest conditions I've ever experienced in my life. No, not probably. They were. I flew the uh, A model Chinook in Vietnam. That was my primary airframe. 50,000 gross, 50,000 pound gross uh, tandem rotor uh, helicopter with an external hook and room inside for 32 people and everything that you could possibly stuff into a flying machine we carried at one time or another, right down to pigs and chickens, but mostly uh, artillery, uh, 105s and the basic load of ammo when we move an entire fire base. My average day in Vietnam was usually at least eight hours in the cockpit, and we were moving 105s. Uh, 105s all over, uh, two and four core. And of course, that evolved into aircraft recovery. I recovered a lot of uh, UH-1H, AH-1G Cobras. We'd come in and grab those machines and get them back to a, a support base and in some real trying circumstances, particularly if we had to do this at night. It was uh, something that will stay in your memory banks forever, swinging along with a cobra underneath you in weather at night. The enemy was a distant factor. Weather and night were killing people right and left in flying machines. Very dangerous occupation uh, as the numbers attest to. 5,000 some machines, helicopters, didn't come back from that war. Not counting them in. A recovering aircraft was probably as tense as anything I'd done in a flying machine up to that point. You're lifting a lot of weight. So you got a machine that is trying to spin on you underneath you. You're down to 40 knots and you're doing this. It's just swinging like crazy. There are so many factors involved that the only solution is to go slower. And when you start going slower, of course, now you're running out of fuel. Uh, but getting shot at, that was a sidebar. Getting killed by the weather, lack of fuel, and that aircraft underneath us was uh, much larger factors. <laughs> One of the most terrifying moments by far was uh, I... Uh, was shot down in uh, Khantum, Vietnam. Had a bulldozer underneath me, and we took a bunch of hits from we don't have any idea. I dropped the bulldozer, and that was a hell of a yank when I hit that switch, because there's a lot of weight getting turned loose off that hook. And then I entered auto rotation. And I'm trying to land a helicopter that's disabled, and I couldn't see. Uh, 
I come to find out, I was just, it was on fire, and I didn't know what had happened. I couldn't see a thing. Come to find out, I thought it was blood. It wasn't. It was oil from the forward transmission lines had been severed, and I had, I don't know, 40-some quarts of 140-degree centigrade oil dumped on me. So it hurt. And then I was finally able to get my visor up so I could see where I was going. Landed the helicopter, broke a few things. But that period of time when we took those hits, making it to the ground, you know, just begging the good Lord, don't let the ship come apart. You know, then it uh, went downhill even worse. Uh, I was out in a post-accident uh, check ride uh, at Play Coup, and in walked a uh, Red Cross lady, Donut Dolly, and she says, you're going home, your father's dead. And I thought to myself, what else, what else? So I left Vietnam about a month early, went back to my father's funeral, buried my father and got on with my life. <laughs> got on with my life. There was no plan to win that war, whatever win meant. A big percentage of the nation had slipped and slid and avoided that kind of service, and I just got caught. And that made me just a pawn in that chess game, and I, I feel the same way today. I was bitter then, I'm bitter today uh, you know, for the treatment. That I'll take to my grave. I came home and I went to Montana and got away from it for uh, a lot of years, just got away. But I didn't want to have a conversation with anybody, no how, no way, and I didn't. It's only been in the last five, six, seven years that I've started to be involved in veterans events, and now I'm up to my eyebrows in veterans events, and it's a very uh, rewarding time in my life, very rewarding. Uh, I flew for the Department of Energy for 30 plus years, flew for the military for 40 some years. I do about 100 hours a year today in a really well restored UH 1H in an OH 6 Cayuse. I just passed my 44th class two flight physical. Well, I just never lost my pilot command status. I've had it for my entire life. And it would break my heart if that ever changed. <laughs> Looking back at Vietnam, the experience was life-altering. But I am the man I am today because of what I endured there and what I know I'm capable of. Uh, a lot of men don't have a clue what they're capable of. I do. I know I'm courageous. I know I'm brave. I know I don't panic. I know that if a circumstance arose today, that I could take care of business. I know that courtesy of that war. A lot of men never face that trial, have no clue how they react. Uh, I do, I do, and that's irreplaceable. There are some serious people out there that lived up to the code, and my code is written in stone in my heart. I don't have to question my behavior when I go to sleep at night. I know I've lived up to my obligation and I take it deadly seriously. What's your code? Duty on our country. <laughs> the duty is, uh, is one of the worst four letter words in the English language. Put me in situations where I say, I can't do this, but duty requires me to. And if you don't take that seriously, you'll find a way to not perform your duty. At night, on a tactical emergency, trying to get a 105 out to, to an American firebase, and I'm sitting up there at 8,000 feet looking at the, all those sparklers, fireworks, tracers going everywhere, and it took everything in my mental makeup to use my left hand to push down on that thrust rod and descend into that hellhole. Wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for that four-letter word, duty. <laughs>